Well, as we said, today's uh, story, uh, today's gospel lesson is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And at first glance, this seems like a very simple story to understand. Because, of course, there's only two characters in it. On the one hand, we have the Pharisee. He's a man who, in Jesus' time, would have been regarded as a very well-respected, a very prominent religious leader. And on the other hand, we have the tax collector. And he is a man who in his time would have been regarded as a vile traitor to his own people because he was a Jew who had collaborated with the Romans who had conquered the Jewish people. He was working for them, so they would not have liked him at all. And yet, of course, in this, story, in this parable of Jesus, there is a great reversal. It's the Pharisee who stands off by himself in the temple to pray, and he looks around him and says, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other men, and I thank you especially that I'm not like that rotten tax collector over there. Unlike him, I, I, keep, I do what you say. I fast, and I tithe, and I pray. So, Lord, thank you for making things just the way they are. But then you have the tax collector who goes into the temple to pray. But when he prays, he hangs his head in shame and he cries, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus tells us that only one of those two men goes home justified before God that day. And I think we all know which one that was. Which man, which man who was justified before God. And so I know you're thinking, well, with a parable like this, what more is there to say? We could end the sermon right there and go, all go home determined that we're going to not be prideful like the mean old Pharisee, but we're going to be humble like the, like the tax collector. But what I want, want to challenge you to think about today is what if it's not so simple? Uh, maybe this parable is a little more challenging to interpret and to ap apply than, than we might think at first. So I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I was a child, I can remember one time when I heard this parable explained to me. It was in a Sunday school class at my church in West Virginia. And the Sunday school teacher, I, you know, she was somebody who knew the Bible well, was, was, was explaining the parable well. But then in her closing prayer for Sunday school that day, I think she fell right into the trap that this parable sets. Because what did she say? She, she closed the, the class by praying, Lord... I thank you that we in this class are not like that Pharisee full of pride. Instead, we thank you that we're a humble people. And we know how much God, we need you. We know that we, we, need, we need to depend upon you. And so think about that for a moment. Did you catch what I'm trying to get at there? Because, uh, you know, I remember even thinking as a child, you know, wait a minute. If we pray thanking God that he didn't make us like the Pharisee, then are we not doing the very thing that Jesus is criticizing the Pharisee for in the first place? Are we not guilty of regarding others with contempt? Which is how Jesus starts that, or Luke actually starts the parable that way. He says it's, it, it, Jesus spoke this parable to people who regarded others with contempt. Only in our case now it's the Pharisee, not the tax collector that we really don't like. And so the longer you think about it, this parable almost puts you in kind of a catch-22 where, where you, it's, it's a dilemma here this parable presents to us because it's true that we don't want to imitate the Pharisees' behavior in this story. We want to be more like the, the tax collector, how he, what he does here. And yet, of course, the moment we start putting people into boxes and saying uh, those people are rotten over there and thank God we're not like them, we're humble folk. Well, we start to imitate the Pharisee without even realizing that we're doing it. So you might be wondering, well, why I had to go and spoil a nice little parable like this, make it so hard and challenging when it seems so easy to interpret. But that's why they pay me the big bucks, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that, that's what I'm up here to do. So, but I do, I, I, in all seriousness, I do think this parable is harder than, than, it, than it looks at first glance. If we're really going to apply it to our lives, and for a moment here, I even want to make it a bit more challenging. Because in fact, this Pharisee that we don't like, he may, if you look at him, ha ha have a lot to recommend him. 
In fact, he's somebody who actually did what I told everyone to do last week. I know last week it was Lady Sunday here, but I preached a sermon at Spencer after this service about how great the Bible is, how important it is to have a daily time in the Word of God if we're expected to grow closer to Him and, and, and more like Him. And I do believe that's true. But guess what? Our friend the Pharisee did all of that. He, he did that very well. He knew the Bible like the back of his hand. He read and studied it each and every day. And what's more, he went beyond that. He tithed and fasted and prayed. He is somebody that we would regard as a model believer. Someone we would tell our children they should be like when they grow up. And yet if nothing else, this, this parable, it shows the limits of what I preached last week. Because of course, it's not enough to read the Bible. The real test is how we behave as a result of that the real test is what we allow the bible to do to us or rather what we allow the holy spot the holy spirit to do to us through the words of scripture because unless the bible transforms us unless it makes it us more like god in love compassion for each and every person that god made in his image well then all the the biblical knowledge in the world means nothing in the end that's the hard truth of a parable like this. And so to get an idea of what I see might be the solution to this dilemma I'm presenting, this, this uh, dilemma that we see in this parable, I'd like to tell you another parable. It's one that comes from the writings of a, or where I encountered it, it was in the writings of Henry Nowen, a famous, famous spiritual writer and Jesuit priest. But he tells this story. It's an old Jewish folktale, actually, but it's about a young fugitive this young man who was on the run and he's de desperately trying to hide from his enemies. And we're never told the reason that he's a fugitive, the reason that he's on the run. But one day this young man enters a small village. And the people of this village, they were kind to him. They offered him a place to stay. But then some soldiers arrived into the vi in the village. And they suspected the young man was hiding there, so they told the town, you've got to give up this man, you've got to show us where he is hiding. And so everybody became afraid, and the soldiers threatened that they were going to burn the village down unless the town gave up this young man who was hiding with them. And he, the, the soldier said, you have till dawn tomorrow morning to make your decision. Are you going to give him up or not? And so naturally, the people of the village, uh, they, they go to their village rabbi and they ask him, what should we do? Should we hand this man over to the soldiers or not? And well, the rabbi was very torn about this because on the one hand, he, he, he loves and wants to protect his people, but he also doesn't know whether he should, he should willingly give up this young man they vowed to protect. And so he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the whole night reading my Bible and look for answers there. So the rabbi does that. He reads the Bible all night, uh, just really desperate, trying to figure something out. And by morning, he comes to the, he discerns the message from the scripture. It is better for one man to die than that the whole people should be lost. And seeing that, the rabbi closed his Bible. He says, well, I know what to do. So he calls the soldiers and he tells where the young man is hiding and says, there he is. And so the soldiers, they lead the young man away to be captured and to be executed. And after that happens, there is a feast in the village because the people are so thankful that their rabbi saved them. And yet the rabbi doesn't attend the feast because he is torn in his heart over what has happened. He's overcome with sadness and that night, an angel visits him. And the angel looks at the rabbi and says, What have you done? And the rabbi explains, Well, I've handed that fugitive over to our enemy. And the angel responds, But don't you know that you have handed over the Messiah himself to be killed? And at that, the rabbi is shocked. He says, But how, how, would, how would I have known something like that? And the angel responds back, if instead of your reading your Bible the whole night last night, you had taken time to visit this, one ma this young man just once and you had looked into his eyes, then you would have known. Then you would have known who he was. 
Now that story, I find that story to be quite haunting because I'm somebody who, like the rabbi in that story, is literally paid to read the Bible. But this story says to me that at times God might have a message for me that I'm not supposed to get from the Bible. I'm supposed to get it from, from my relationship with other people. That's where God's wanting to speak to me at times. And even worse, even more challenging for me, sometimes that may be through people I don't even like. People who I consider my enemies. God might be trying to speak to me through them. But think about it for a moment. Why shouldn't that be the case? The Bible tells us right from the start that every single person God made is made in his image and his likeness. And therefore there is something of God in the face of every single person I encounter during the week, no matter how rotten I might think they are. And that means that if we're not capable of looking in the eyes of the people around us and seeing something of Jesus in them, something that is beloved by God, made in his image, then staying up all night reading the Bible is not going to do anything to help us. It's not going to help us out, just like it didn't help the Pharisee out in our story today. Because you see what's really tragic about the Pharisee and the the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is right from the beginning Jesus tells us he goes off to pray by himself. Jesus notes that. He says he stands by himself. And so what he's doing, in other words, is he's removing himself from the presence of the quote-unquote sinners like the tax collector thinking that anyone who behaves like that is not worth his time. And the thing is, in one sense, his behavior is understandable. Tax collectors in that day were notorious sinners. They were people who were regarded as traitors, people who had collaborated with the enemies of the Jews. But what the Pharisee forgets is that beneath that label of sinner that we're very quick to put on other people is somebody who is beloved by God, who is made in God's image and likeness. And if the Pharisee hadn't stood by himself that day, but it stood just a little bit closer to that tax collector he regarded as so vile and such a sinful man, then maybe he would have learned something about his own need, his own dependence on God. Because friends, if you're ever under the impression that any of us can graduate from that simple prayer that the tax collector prays, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, If you think we can move beyond the need to pray that prayer, then you are sadly mistaken. Because we are all just as dependent upon God's grace and mercy as that tax collector was. Some of us are just a little bit better at deluding ourselves that we don't need it. We think like the Pharisee that we don't need to pray that prayer any longer. And yet part of our problem, part of our challenge as Christian people, you know, we go to church, we read our Bibles, you know, we see the world through, through this phrase, uh, you know, it gets repeated a lot, love the, hate the sin, love the sinner. And in one sense that's true, you know, who, who's heard that phrase before? You know, we looked at it in our study on the half-truths I've mentioned a number of times, and I, it, that lesson stood out to me because I would have said before I really studied it that that phrase is a whole truth. There's nothing to not like about it because certainly God loves all of us, even though he hates at times what we do. God hates the sin but loves the sinner. But the problem with how we often use that phrase, what makes it a half-truth sometimes, is that when we say it, whether we intend to or not, we're putting ourselves in God's position. And we're making ourselves the judge because when we say hate the sin, love the sinner, too often we're talking about a group over there who are the sinners. And we're portraying ourselves as the people who now have it all figured out. Saying, Lord, thank God that we're the humble people now who don't need need to, to daily depend upon God. So in other words, we're standing off by ourselves like the Pharisee. We're thanking God that he didn't make us like those poor souls over there. So repeating that phrase, hate the sin, love the sinner, it makes us forget that Jesus said not to worry about the the, the speck in your brother or sister's eyes before you have removed the great plank sticking out of your own eyes. And of course that tells us that my own, tells me at least, my own sin gives me plenty to worry about without without, uh, focusing on somebody else's sin. And so maybe my goal should be to hate my own sin and yet love the sinner. Certainly that's what the tax collector does. He doesn't look at anybody else. He prays, Lord, have mercy on me. Or maybe I shouldn't just go into the world every day thinking I've got to love all the sinners I'm going to meet today, but I should go into the world thinking I've got to love my neighbor. Because that's how Jesus puts it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
And how, how might this story have ended differently if the Pharisee went into the temple that day, thinking the, the tax collector is not first and foremost a sinner. He is my neighbor because he is a man loved by God, made in his image. There's a great line from the evangelist uh, Billy Graham. Uh, his daughter uh, Gigi uh, tells this story. You know Reverend Billy Graham, the famous evangelist. In the late 90s, they had been to this anniversary celebration for the, uh, the 75th anniversary of Time magazine. And the Grahams sat right at the table with, with the then President uh, Bill Clinton and, and Mrs. Clinton. And they, they had this nice dinner, but it was right during the time when there was all you know, kinds of scandal with uh, the, you know, the, the extramarital affair and all that. And Reverend Graham and Gigi, his daughter, on the way back from the dinner, they were talking about, well, you know, how difficult would that be if you were a public figure in America to have everybody knowing you and discussing your business? And that's when Graham told, said a very famous line. He said, uh, it, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's God's job to judge. But it's our job to love. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's God's job to judge. And it's our job to love. You know, at a time right like this in our country, when it feels like people in our country are being torn apart in so many different directions, certainly we could move, use some of that same spirit that moved uh, your Reverend Billy Graham to say, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, it's God's job to judge, but it's our job to love. You know, we could use that spirit in our own church. There are many people now saying the divisions in the United Methodist Church are every bit as bad and, could, and divisive as the issues our country is facing. And could our church go off in different directions? And in such a situation, I think we've got to ask ourselves, are we as believers going to just act just like the world expects us to act? Or are we as Christians going to disagree in a way that looks different from the world? Are we willing to remain in, in the same body of and I hope we are, the same body, the same body of Christ with folks who may disagree with us on certain issues, but who share with us a love for Jesus Christ, our Savior. You know, I believe that we, as Christians, we're always stronger together. We're always stronger when the body of Christ is a diverse body that reflects all the people that God has made. And if we're going to take seriously that line, we sometimes sing, let peace begin with me then we're called to draw near to those who are every bit as different from us than the Pharisee was from the tax collector. So, you know, at a time we, when Hillary supporters, you know, hate Trump supporters and vice versa, Trump supporters hate Hillary supporters and all that, well, how are we as Christians supposed to respond? Well, at the very least, and at the very basic response to Jesus' message, we should take time to pray for one another each and every day, especially if you're a Hillary supporter, you should take time to see the image of God in somebody who supports Trump, or vice versa, if you support Trump, you should take time to see that, that somebody who supports Hillary is a beloved child of God. That's at the very least, especially if you consider that person to be your enemy. Those are the people you should most be praying for and loving and showing mercy each and every day. But of course, that's not easy. And if the Pharisee had gone into the temple that day prepared to, to grant that same grace to the tax collector, this would have been a very different story with a very different ending. The Pharisee would have learned about his own daily dependence on God, his own need for mercy each and every day. And if he had shown love to that tax collector, maybe that tax collector could have learned something too. He could have learned something from the Pharisee about the Bible, about the deeper matters of the law. And so, friends, we believe in a God who loves us, a God who sent his son Jesus into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy. You know, what we believe about God, it's summed up very well in a story uh, that I've often told about, about Karl Barth, who was one of the great minds, one of the great theologians of the 20th century. But near the end of his life, Karl Barth was speaking at the University of Chicago to a number of seminary students, and they asked him, they said, they, they, they asked him to, if he could just sum up his life's work, sum up his life's thought in only one sentence. And he thought for a moment, and the, the students, they were waiting very eagerly with pen and paper, thinking they were going to hear something just amazingly prof profound and sophisticated. But Bart sat and he thought, and then he got a smile on his face, and he said, the greatest insight that I have ever had in my life is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
And friends, if Karl Barth, a mind like that, could not come up with something any better, uh, then who am I to try to do differently? That is the gospel. Jesus loves me. He loves you. He loves all of us. And he calls us into a body of grace and mercy where we have the opportunity to show one another that, that, that same mercy and grace we've received from him. So may the Lord bless us now, and may he draw us closer together until all of us know the love of the Son of God who first loved us and gave himself for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.